Um, this book, Never Again, which is a story about the history of anti-fascism in the 70s, two main campaigns were up against racism in the anti-Nazi league. But I do want to say just at, at the outset that though I'll be talking about that book, in a sense, when I wrote it, which was, um, it's, it's, a, it's a rewritten version of, of an older book that I'd written about 10, 12 years ago. But when I was rewriting it last spring, it wasn't the only thing I was working on. At the same time, I was writing another book, which is called The New Authoritarians, and will be out with Pluto in April. And that's a book that's all about now. And it's kind of a strange thing that, that when I was writing about the 70s, two-thirds of my brain was thinking about today, actually. And so although everything I'll, I'll say will be about what happened in the 70s, except maybe at the end, I don't want people to focus on the past. The past is great, but I want people to focus on the present <coughs> and to think through how this works as a model. Maybe it doesn't work as a model, but what, what it is that we need to be doing today. Right, so I'll just um, start off properly by saying, obviously this is a book about anti-fascist movements. But there's no point just telling the story about us. There's a, an article the um, communist historian um, Eric Cobsbaum once wrote. He said he, he, was, he was reviewing a bunch of books about the history of the Communist Party. <coughs> and he said the problem with all these books is that it's like watching a black and white film of a wrestling match, but you only see one of the two wrestlers. You see our side, the people who are fighting, but we don't see what they're fighting against. So rather than starting from anti-fascism, I just want to start with the National Front and what sort of party it was and what, what sort of enemy it was. Um, and maybe a good place to begin is, because I've already mentioned this is a rewritten version of a book that I originally published about 10 or 12 years ago. But when I first told the story, I, I think my, the way I thought about the National Front was very similar to the way people did in the 70s, which is in essence, this was a simple fascist party, or to use the terminology people use most often in the 70s, a Nazi party. Now, when I think about National Front now, I see it kind of differently. The, the way I see it is something else, which is a far-right party with a leadership who'd been through various fascist groups that, was, that had an idea that it wanted to be something else, but didn't know how to get there. And I'll just give some examples, from, from because now, compared even to 10 years ago, we've got memoirs written by people who are in the National Front, and you can get a sense of um, some stories from them. One person I'll mention is a woman called Jenny Dodd, and she was a founder member of the National Front. She was one of, she'd been in one of the three groups um, that came together to launch the National Front. And in 1979, 1979, she writes to her friend Richard. And she said, Richard, we've got a problem with the National Front. It's been taken over by this terrible National Socialist. And we've got to drive them out of the National Front. Now, Richard, one of the things which worries me is I talk to all my friends, and they all agree on this. And I say, Richard's on our side in this struggle against these Nazis in the National Front. And obviously she's in the National Front, and she's trying to make something a bit more moderate. She says, but Richard, they say, Richard, you're a Holocaust denier, but I know you're not really. The, the person she was um, writing was a man called Richard Verrill, who, under a pseudonym Richard Harwood, had written a Holocaust denial pamphlet, um, Did Six Million Really Die? And he's actually, in a sense, Britain's most important Holocaust denier. But a member of the National Front could write to him, I think he was an ally in her internal battle against, against people who were very ideological and national socialists. In other words, she thought she was something more moderate. But again, she didn't know what it was. A second example, um, again, a founder member of the National Front. This man's John Bean, and in 1964, he'd stood in Southall for a party called the British National Party. He got getting on for 10% of the vote. And his electoral success was actually the thing which brought all these different far-right groups together to launch the National Front. They thought, this proves we can get a mass audience. And he writes in his memoir, and he talks because he'd been through different iterations of the far-right, and he talked about being, in 1962, being involved in this stunt where he and various other people involved in the really neo-Nazi, uniform-wearing, total bring-back Hitler, if you're going to get married, do it over a copy of Mein Camp. He'd been part of that group. And they'd gone off to, um, to, to demonstrate outside a meeting, which was a, um, in, in London, of people who were veterans of the Warsaw Ghetto and were commemorating the Warsaw Ghetto. A lot of them survived the Holocaust. And he jeers at them and, and he goes home. And he said, I had a nightmare. And in my nightmare, I saw people in striped uniforms, like the, like the victims, the prisoners in the Holocaust, people were going to go down. I saw that. And he said, I had that nightmare for 15 years. 
every night I dreamt that same dream, and I woke up scared. It didn't stop being on the far right. It didn't stop being a supporter of the National Front. But there's that sense that they're trying to find something else, but they don't know what it is. And the person who really sums up that sense of being between, in an awkward place in between, is John Tyndall. John Tyndall, obviously, in 1962, had been the leader of the Greater British Movement. Perhaps the most famous image that anti-fascists produced, and we produced it, that's right, I said we, you, the people in the movement produced it again and again and again. There's a picture of John Tyndall wearing what looked like a Nazi uniform. The first magazine he set up was called Spearhead. You read Spearhead, um, it was printed in Gothic script, so it looked like a Nazi paper. And it would have these ridiculous journalism you know, We exist in order to create a Volksgemeinschaft of the greater British people. So completely... Um, it, it, it hocked to this, this notion of fascism as some sort of movement that would be a liberation for those people. But when he joined the National when, he, when the National Front was formed in 1967, they said to John Tyndall, um, you're not allowed to join. You're too extreme. We're trying to create an electoral right-wing party that's going to be more moderate. And you have to promise that you're going to be on best behaviour, and if you do, then maybe some of your friends can join, but you can't. And they actually banned him from membership for the first two years of the National Front. Now, of course, by the 70s, he'd been allowed in, he'd become the chairman of the National Front. But I'm giving all these things as illustrations to say that there's a part of the National Front which is trying to become a kind of electoral party, far-right party, a party which has disavowed the legacy of fascism. But it can't, because there haven't been enough of them yet. It doesn't know what that looks like. It doesn't understand how that might work. It's had no models to copy. And of course, I've given some, some of the people I've been talking about so far already a sort of electoral far-right, some of them fascist loyalists. There's also another type you get around the National Front, which is just people who, are, in essence, are attracted to the National Front um, out of the promise of racist violence. And they might even actually not be members of the National Front, but the National Front exists for them as a way to legitimise and justify the violence they already do. An example I give in my book is a man called Fred Chalice, who's just a 20-year-old drifter. He, he goes from pub to pub, doesn't really have a job, doesn't really have much of life, and he's going to go on and spend a lot of his life in prison. Uh, in 1978, he kills um, a homeless person who's Asian, kills him, uh, and with his blood, um, takes rights on the wall, NF. And when he's put on trial, um, the police say, we believe he's done a number of other attacks on people in this area of East London. He said, yeah. And they go through, and he pleads guilty to over 300 assaults on other people. Now, the reason why I focus on him isn't so much he's a member of the National Front. That's not kind of what the National Front does. Its success legitimises, gives a route through to all these people to do that kind of violence. Well, at the same time, it's quite so, which is kind of an awkward place. So, to some extent, it wants to disavow fascism, but it has no idea what that disavowal would mean, or how it would work, or how it could be something else. I'm not saying anything better. It doesn't want to be better. It wants to kind of present itself as more moderate in order to be more popular. It doesn't want to break away from fascism, and never really does. But, in the context of um, post-war migration, the large the tens of thousands of original people who came here in the 40s and 50s. Um, in the history of post-war migration, the National Front um, gets a high vote by saying that it's the party that's going to repatriate black migrants to Britain. And through a series of racist um, um, press scandals, it's able to pose as the authentic voice of racism. If you're against black people coming to Britain, then you should vote for the National Front. Now, I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to focus on one because it brings us right up to where I want to start the story. 1976, spring 1976, um, the um, fear of the Malawi nations. And people may remember in April, May 76, the press story broke just days before the local elections, and it's sort of that Britain was going to be swamped by a new influx of migrants. The Daily Mirror, Denver, left the newspaper, had on its front page, a um, new wave of Asian migration to Britain, and all the papers predicted tens or fifty or hundreds of thousands of people could come here. And perhaps this is where I get to slightly take back what I said earlier about large numbers of people. The start of the Malawi nation crisis was in Crawley on the south coast. Um, a number of um, families have been banned living in temporary accommodation. 
two families, um, each with children, but maybe six or seven people altogether. So when they said 120,000 people coming to Britain, they meant six or seven people had come to Britain. Um, and those families, social workers came along and said, look, um, their kids here, they're going to be right, and we'll, we'll do our best to look after them. Social workers go. But it gets it into the papers, and it's in the papers. And that's the immediate um, spark to the 76 elections, which see the National Front where it stand, get between 7 and 8% of the vote, 40,000 votes in Leicester, comes in 60 seats winning a council seat in Leicester. And then for the next year, the National Front is just consistently getting very, very good election results. Um, by 77 in London, you get 100,000 um, votes in the GLC elections. Um, in essence, where they stand, and the Liberals also stand, about 40% of the time the National Front gets more votes than the Liberals. So it feels like they're contending seriously to be the third main um, party in Britain. The other thing, last one said before coming on to anti fascists, is that there's another part of this story as well. And it's a kind of context. And I appreciate a lot of people in this room, um, I'm, I'm 46. And I, I was three and four when a lot of this was going on. You know, I, I wasn't there on the streets, but I know the context. It was part of my life too. Um, one of the things which was going on was that this was just 30 years after the war. You know, if you walked around Britain some, you would see, you'd still see bombed out places <laughs> which had been destroyed in the Second World War, and no one had actually gone around to repair them. And the Second World War was an insistent, immediate piece of, of culture. It was in boys' comics, battle magazines, which were selling quarter of a million copies at this point a week. Um, it was in children's stories. It was in films. It was in adult novels. Um, stories about Nazis going off to Latin America and they would come back here. Or, they were, or other stories where they were... Where they were, they were launching their conspiracy from Britain. And the reason why again, I want to focus on this is again, to help put it in the context of today and think about the kind of Fred Chalice. If, let's say, in life, all you wanted to be was just a horrible, unpleasant, racist, and violent person, fascism was there. It was visible. It was part of the fabric of people's lives. It was an immediate, recent historical memory. But it made it very easy for people to be, as it were, not just on the far right, but fascist. And again, the point I'm making obviously is about today when we're further away from war and other things have come to say. All right. Okay, that's enough on them. Now us. Um, the first campaign I want to talk about, Rock Against Racism, starts in the um, summer of 1976. And it begins when Eric Clapton, the blues guitarist, gets up on stage. He's not the first musician, David Bowie's said horrendous things in an interview with Playboy magazine. Um, just a few weeks before, but Clapton gets up and interrupts the concert in Birmingham and makes a speech um, saying, you know, we'll support, you know, a, a rambling, drunken speech, barely a speech, but he says it. In the aftermath, um, a photographer, Red Saunders, um, and half a of his friends, write a letter to the to music press saying, um, you know, we need, a, we need a rank and file movement against the racist poison music. Who shot the show? It sure as hell wasn't you. And this is the launch of Rock Against Racism. Now, often when I talk to, to people who, who weren't there, and they often they have um, all these really great developed ideas about what Rock Against Racism stood for and its campaign and how it fused together anti-fascism and anti-racism. And it all sounds brilliant. And I think it kind of sounds brilliant because Rock Against Racism had one great asset, which had a writer, David Widgley, who wrote the most beautiful prose which could attach these different courses and could explain things. And maybe one of the things I'll do at some point tonight is, is read some uh, just short extracts from some things he wrote for, for the Rock Against Racism, Fancy and Temporary Hoarder. But I don't want to start off with the idea that people came into this moment already equipped with the plan of what they were going to do. There are lots of different stories about why Rock Against Racism was launched. In one story, which is as plausible as any other, essentially two or three people were having a chat They'd been thinking for some time about doing a benefit, maybe for the Right to Work to campaign. It wasn't yet sure. They saw the Eric Clapton stuff, they wrote them to do a letter about that. But at that point, there is no further plan. And not only that, but there isn't that many people. I appreciate we're on 15 people or so here, here tonight. But when Rock Against Racism is launched, they have their first organising meetings. It's Red Saunders, people who signed his letter, well, one of them's um, a lefty in a group called SWP, which I'll come on to a bit more later. Um, 
half, four or five of them are fellow actors in radical anti-capitalist theatre who, who do kind of stunty agitprop theatre. One guy says agent. A couple of people just friends of his who signed the letter because he shoved the letter in front of him and play no further part in the campaign. It, it's not a mass movement immediately. It's a, it's a sort of triad that could have gone anywhere. But it went big. And one of the reasons why it went big is the letter cat throws them. Something like 600,000 people write the back to the letter and they say, we, we want to sign up, we want to be part of your campaign. And what that means is from then on, it, there's always an audience. There's always people who know the idea. I've mentioned the fanzine, a lot of the people who come into Rock Against Racing quite quickly, designers, photographers. Um, they're not musicians. There are a few musicians, Tom Robinson, but it's, it's artistic people, cultural people, but they're not necessarily musicians. There are relatively few musicians involved, at least early on. And quite quickly they're putting on gigs. Um, and this is starting to be a movement that's growing in size. Um, they put on a conference. You know, they, you go to the gigs and there's... Um, couple hundred people at them. There's three or four hundred. But it's at that sort of level. It hasn't broken through yet. All right, then the next thing I want to mention is the Battle of Lewisham um, in, in summer of um, 77 now. And, and this wasn't the first confrontation between um, far right and national by any means, but I'll, I'll focus on it because it's, it's an important one. Um, it begins with the police arresting 18... Um, um, young um, black men um, and accusing them of taking part in, in muggings in, the local, in their local area in South East London. The raids which are done are particularly violent and vicious. You can imagine people in their homes and we've got photographs um, of, for example, um, the Foster family who've become the nub of a, a, campaign, a family campaign in defence of the kids who've been arrested. So you imagine, you know, two up bedrooms upstairs, kind of normal council homes, and then doors smashed in with hammers, people scattering in fear. The raids are particularly violent, particularly offensive, and, and it feels in that whole area like people are under attack. But as I mentioned, the family campaign is launched for the people who've been arrested. What then happens is the National Front does something they've done repeatedly over the previous five years, which said, right, there's a bunch of lefties getting organised uh, in anti-racist ways, obviously there'll be a backlash against that. And that's something they've done quite successfully around various workplaces, for example. They've been able to pull in people who, who in a sense, support, actually, um, the police, or support the idea that white people should have better living standards and black, or better wages than black people. So they're looking for a backlash, and they call an anti-mugging march. With the anti-mugging march, in a sense, they have a problem. The left has a route into this local black community in South East London, Lush, through the families they've met, campaigning against police violence. The right doesn't have a way in. They never have a person in Lush. They never have a way of making the campaign personal. So when, when you actually have the demonstration in August 78, in terms of National Front, it's the 800 people who always go on National Front marches. In terms of the left, it's an all London mobilisation by the left. There's been um, a kind of pacifist, I'm simplifying the time. A, a peaceful demonstration against National Front on the day, which is taken you not confront the National Front, but none people go from that to further protests against the National Front. And something like 3,000 people, all different things, come together, attack the National Front march, and scatter it. Um, people are, um, well, it's, again, it's my favourite photos at the time. You see these um, um, black youngsters from the local area, just 17 and 18 year old kids. And they're holding their hands the tattered piece of cloth from the National Front's Honour Guard um, banner, which I have at the front of all their demos. It's been ripped into shreds, and everyone from local communities grab their bit of it. John Tyndall, the leader of the National Front, marches them off to a car park outside Lewisham, gives this sort of depressed speech. And basically, we're never going to be able to march again unless the police give them guns and are able to shoot the demonstrators in the street. Without that, we've got no chance. Um, and so for the left, Lewisham becomes, and in stories, the convention of Lewisham becomes this very heroic moment. You know, the, the left smashed the right off the street and dealt them a blow, which they remembered a long time. And they did remember it a long time. Maybe they still remember it today. Just one example. Um, people may remember quite recently the killing of paratrooper uh, Lee Rigby about three years ago. When that happened, um, Nick Griffith, leader of the British National Party, 
uh, gave a YouTube program. He said, I hear the English Defence League planning to march through that area. Don't. He said, we got smashed up the street at Lewisham. We've never been able to march through a multiracial area since. Don't. It's the wrong tactics. But that memory's gone deep on both sides. So what I hope now I'll say might be a bit surprising. Um, while on the left we remember Lewisham often as a great victory, it's Cable Street, it's Lewisham. That isn't necessarily how it felt that night. The TV footage of the Battle of Lewisham showed a woman in her 70s sobbing on the pavement, um, presumably having been attacked by a, a member of the National Front, presumably having been attacked by young lefties in their, in their 20s. And if you read the newspaper coverage that followed Lewisham, there's this howl of anguish because the left seemed to have gone too far. There was too much violence. This isn't appropriate. This is unacceptable. Um, Michael Foot um, denounced the SWP, who, who blamed the Lewisham as red fascists. Uh, th there's an earnest discussion. Obviously, we have to ban all left-wing demonstrations for the foreseeable future, but should we go as far as actually banning left-wing political parties? And that was the tenor of the discussion. Now, we don't remember that, but unless you have a sense of that, you won't understand um, what followed next and why it was actually quite a sharp piece of political insight which is the people most associated with that demonstration, uh, the SWP, turned around and approached the left wing of the Labour Party and said that we're going to have to work out some sort of compromise where we work together. One of the reasons why we've got to do this is because we don't necessarily deal with this level of backlash all by ourselves. Um, and it's, again, it's, if you actually interview you know, Peter Hayne, Neil Kinner, Paul Holborn, the people involved in these discussions, it's quite funny listening to them, um, Jim Nicholl from the SDP. Because in the central Labour Party's perspective, they thought what they'd got was a promise that the SDP was now going to tone everything down and be tremendously moderate. Or at least that's what they say now they thought they were getting. But if you talk to people from the SDP, what they thought they were getting is we're going to carry on demonstrating. And they did. They thought, actually, when we demonstrate again, now we're going to have the support of the whole Labour movement behind us. Very biological. So then we get the launch of the Anti-Nazi League, a movement that rapidly grows to like 50, 60,000 people, um, 20 national unions sign up, several hundred Labour Party branches affiliate, several hundred trade union branches affiliate. Um, the Anti-Nazi becomes a mass movement. Key to it becoming a mass movement, and again, I kind of feel I'm, I'm going to have to sort of rush a bit now. Maybe I did too much earlier on, the, on, the, on their side, and I've left the bits about us too, so I have to go through them a bit quicker. Um, but the key to the breakthrough of the anti Nazi League is in 1978, the summer of the carnivals. Um, one of these people, one of the leaders of the anti Nazi League, has quite a modest, low key idea for a carnival. He says, What we could do is we could call it carnival and we could put you know, a band on a, on a lorry back and drive it through, say, Oxford Street, and then lots of people come and clap, and that would show that we've got a big audience. And he takes it to people who've already been involved in its rock against racism, who aren't necessarily the world's greatest political organisers in the conventional sense and in ordinary times, but are, bless them, cultural Bolsheviks. And they hear this chest and say, yeah, look, we'll do that, but we'll raise it a bit. Um, and they go along to the bands, which are the most exciting bands of time. Tom Robinson, who's had number one hit, still pulse because you need to have a black band at the end of, this, at the, end of the day. Um, the Clash, just breaking through and becoming the biggest um, punk band at the moment. Um, Sham 69, uh, they get the singer from Sham 69 to perform alongside The Clash. The singer who's, got the most, who, who's most listened to by precisely this audience of young racist skinheads that the Rock Against Racism is trying to take back and make sure they can't just be in the gift of the far right. And you get to carnivals, 80,000 at the first one in London, 100,000 at the second. Um, as we're in Edinburgh, I shall mention the 8,000 people who were at Craig Miller Park Coming to hear free scars, uh, vows, morons. Um, even one of those bands, scars, um, I understand, um, actually bottled off stage because the organisers in Edinburgh's blessed their cotton socks. They said they had put out a leaflet saying the Clash are going to be playing. And then the last band comes on and it's not the Clash, and that wasn't hugely popular. I understand with the audience. Um, Everything becomes set for the key moment is the 1979 election. I, I, I don't really have time to say, I'll say a sentence immediately before the 1979 election is there's another huge demonstration. Southall, 
on row one and slash split each is killed. I'd very much like if people want to ask more details about that, go through that in terms of questions. I'll mention it only to say that because that's happening days before the um, April election result. And also because, in a sense, it's another rerun of a community mobilisation in Southall against Farage. which becomes the most effective way to defeat them. Something like 8,000 people opposing the National Front in Southall. And on the National Front side, there are 20 of them huddled in a tiny election meeting, wondering what the hell happens when the meeting ends and we have to go outside. The numbers become tremendously favourable to the left because of events like the physical defeat of the National Front side diversion. But anyway, Southall, 79 election. In the build-up to the 1979 election, it becomes more and more clear to the National Front the only way they can hold together this creaking coalition of neo-Nazi revivalists, people trying to be an electoral far right, people just interested in the violence, people actually mainly interested in just um, repatriating black people, nothing else. The only way it can hold them together is by promising a big breakthrough in the next elections. And they stand 300 candidates in 79 elections, um, twice the number they've ever stood before, enough to get them a, an election broadcast. Enough also to mean that at the end of 79, they have to spend what's left of the National Front has to spend almost the rest of its entire existence fundraising for all those bloody deposits they have to pay. They stand all these seats in 79, they get an average of 1% of the vote. Where they stand, their vote falls by 50 to 75% compared to before. Again, time short, and I don't believe lots of time for discussion. There's a whole controversy since. You know, was it the movement that defeated the National Front? Was it Margaret Thatcher? Margaret Thatcher moved to the right, made a speech about people in Britain being swamped by migrants. Thatcher, Thatcher not in a good way, but Thatcher contributes something to this historical moment. Um, but you know, they've been right with. Conservative MPs going back to Enoch Powell in 1968 making anti-migrant speeches about every six months for the last ten years, and none of them took votes away from the National Front. Um, votes do go away from the National Front, and they go away from the National Front because the National Front no longer seems a normal or respectable party. It's gone beyond the pale. So, April 79, expecting big results, their vote collapses, National Front splits in three ways, and suffers a defeat. From, this, from the entire period, it's such a defeat in which it doesn't recover, or its sort of successes don't recover for more than a decade. Um, really bring it towards the end, and maybe now I just want to say just a couple of sentences about today. Um, sometimes you hear in the movement the idea, well, we know how to defeat the forex, so we did. All we have to do is just do it again. That's not what I'm saying. I've gone in, into the history more deeply for husband than, than most people normally tell the story. So I want, people, I want the story to come alive. I want it to feel like a story which people can learn from. But we don't learn from it by thinking we just repeat it. In exactly the same constellation forces, and that will make it all right. There's just a couple of things, two or three things I want to allude to, which are definitely different now. Um, firstly, we're another 40 years away from the Second World War. The far right today has different influence. It can draw on historical moments. 9-11, and all Islamophobia since then, as well as just the Second World War. Um, the relationship between culture and the right is different. Um, in the 70s, the far right is able to draw on this kind of moment in which culture is fascinated by fascism, and maybe takes some of that in a fascist direction, but actually the links between culture and the far right are actually relatively tenuous. They're kind of contextual. They're the way there are all these punk bands wearing swastikas. But there aren't punks. <laughs> Susie C does not join the National Front. Um, but that's different from today. Today, the far right's able to draw much more closely on things like the internet and Reddit, on their presence in YouTube, on whole cultural apparatus of, of, of things out there which provide support for them, which weren't there 40 years ago. It certainly doesn't make our struggle easier perhaps makes it harder, and it perhaps means that the need for some of our anti-fascism to be cultural probably makes that actually more urgent, even than it was in the 70s. Um, so the ways in which today is different and the ways which we need, in which what we need to do is different. But I'll end just with this point. If someone lived, um, say, if, if someone comes to Britain as part of the winterish generation, so it's around 1950, the whole experience of being in Britain between 1950 and 1976 was that every time people talked about migration, it was in a negative way. 
whenever you felt that a large number of people were expressing their views about immigration, the message of the press was always, and people hate it, and people want it to stop. And this message was, it was like a drumbeat which never stopped. It went on and on and on and on. What happened in 1976, 1977, 1978, 1979, was that for the first time you saw actually it's possible to create a majority of people who are anti-racist, who didn't think which didn't think like that, but in all the different ways race expressed itself, in all the different ways in which fascism expressed itself, that there was a majority against that too. Um, and that really is where I want to end, with that notion. We showed that it's possible, that movement showed that it's possible to establish, prove an anti-racist, anti-fascist majority. And my God, it's something which this period cries out for as well. <laughs>